uh, one of the characteristics of life is reproduction. And since all animals reproduce, we're going to talk about um, some uh, adaptations and then some human uh, reproductive qualities. Uh, here's a picture of two earthworms. Earthworms are interesting because they're hermaphroditic. We'll come back to that. Uh, two earthworms mating. Okay, so there are basically two types of reproduction, major types, asexual and sexual. We've talked about this before. I don't know that we need to have any more uh, description of the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction. Uh, there are uh, invertebrates that reproduce asexually, either by dividing or separate a parent. And when we're talking about invertebrates, we're usually talking about microscopic things, not always. Uh, there's one. There's uh, a couple different ways to do it: budding and fragmentation. Okay, uh, fragmentation. Uh, some things like starfish can fragment. You can cut starfish up into pieces and throw them back, and they can all grow as long as they have part of the central disc. So, fabulous drawing ability here. Okay, well, that's a four. Strong starfish, if you cut this up, as long as you have part of the central disc, they'll grow another one back. Um, many animals use reproductive cycles. When asexually or sexually, they'll use cycles. And uh, a lot of times it's related to seasons. Uh, some are controlled, many are controlled by hormones and cues from the environment. Okay, it could be temperature, it could be uh, amount of light. Uh, kind of like plants that way. Here is an example of an adaptation. Uh, some fish, amphibians, and some lizards uh, reproduce by something called parthenogenesis. And this is a process in which you can develop an egg without fertilizing the egg, where the egg becomes um, the egg becomes an adult without being fertilized. Back a second, click back again. Okay, here's a uh, species of lizard where the male, the lizard that's being a male, is mounting the lizard that's being a female, but this stimulates the egg, the ovulation of the egg, and stimulates the ovulation, and the egg will develop into an adult. The lizards alternate between being male like and being female like. So this lizard is going to have the baby, produce the egg, which is going to become an adult. And then later on in time, this lizard will become the female and produce an egg. And they will become an adult. That's an interesting method where you don't have to find necessarily another male or female when populations are small. So that's not truly sexual reproduction. But if you can't really ever encounter a mate, Okay, if you're something like an earthworm, you become hermaphroditic. If you're, well, you don't become, you are hermaphroditic. Like the earthworms, each individual has a male and a female reproductive system. Okay, and there's something called sequential hermaphroditism, where an individual can reverse its sex during his lifetime. You can be a male and later on become a female or vice versa. Okay, some species of fish do that, and worms are hermaphroditic. So when we talk about fertilization, then we organisms have ways to get the egg to meet the sperm, or to get the sperm to meet the egg. Okay, one common way, or one way, is called external fertilization, where the eggs are shed by the female, and sperm fertilize them in the external environment. Okay, a picture example of that are frogs. Okay, the frog lays her eggs. The male sits on top but doesn't really do anything except sheds his sperm into the water. And the sperm fertilize the eggs that way. Fish do this also. You'll see a fish bed. Okay, if you've ever noticed fish beds in the bottom of the lake. Okay, and the, the female swims along and lays her eggs in there. And then the male spreads his sperm over the top of it. Okay, that's uh, external fertilization. Internal fertilization Sperm are deposited in or near the female reproductive tract. Okay? And um, a lot of time, internal fertilization 
requires complex interactions, behavioral interactions. And then, of course, as we talked about before, when we talked about evolution, okay, the, you have to have the parts fit. If the parts don't fit, then you're not going to get fertilization internally. So, uh, some organisms that reproduce sexually, this, this uh, slide kind of talks about the fact that all species produce more offspring. Who's going to survive? Many terrestrial animals develop have eggs, okay, because the eggs can withstand harsh environments. Some animals, uh, like, uh, retain the embryo inside the female. And those are two different adaptations to ensure survival of the offspring. Some animals have parental care. Okay, for example, I think this is pretty cool, this predaceous diving beetle here with all the eggs on his back. So the female is sort of taking care of the eggs. So uh, most systems of sexual reproduction, organs have, organisms have systems that produce gametes. Okay? Sperm and egg generally. We talked about this in plants. That plants have systems that produce pollen and ovules. Okay? Most complex systems have tubes and glands and stuff to nourish and protect gametes and developing embryos. Usually in the male, to nourish and protect the sperm, and the female to nourish and protect the egg and the baby. Here's an example uh, using honeybees. Males have a very complex reproductive system, and females have a very complex reproductive system with lots of tubes and glands. So, um, we talked about this a little bit with meiosis, sperm and egg, oogenesis is egg production, the two prefix means eggs, and then of course sperm production, oogenesis is egg production, remember it's meiosis, you start, let's say you're a, um, a drosophila with eight chromosomes, divide that into four sets of haploid cells with four chromosomes each. Okay, but in meiosis, in oogenesis, cytokinesis is unequal. So, when you're done, you have one egg, so when the cytoplasm divides, you get one large and one really small. Okay, in spermatogenesis, you produce, uh, sperm are produced uninterrupted Okay, and in oogenesis, there's eggs are produced once a month, for example, in humans. So in females, the secretion of hormones and the reproductive events they regulate are cyclic. Okay, the secretion of hormones and the reproductive events they regulate are cyclic or go in cycles. There are basically two types of cycles. There are menstrual cycles in primates and astral cycles in other mammals, okay? And in both cases, the female thickens up in the female body, the endometrium, which is the inner wall of the uterus, thickens in preparation for implantation of the egg. So, the difference between menstrual cycles and estral cycles, menstrual cycles, uh, they shed the wall, the endometrium, they shed the endometrium, and in estrous cycles, the endometrium is reabsorbed. So, a cat has an estrous cycle. It doesn't produce, doesn't shed the endometrium, okay? And they go into, quote, heat. Whereas in mammals and, or in humans and other primates, there's no time frame. You can, uh, sexual receptivity means that you could fertilize the egg at pretty much any time. This diagram you're going to need to memorize. This diagram is of the ovarian cycle in humans. Okay? Two primary hormones involved. 
one called LH and one called FSH, produced in the pituitary gland. This is inside the ovary. This is the wall of the uterus. And if you don't know where these organs are in a human, you might want to look at a diagram of a human female. So in the ovary, uh, pituitary hormones are produced. By the way, the di this cycle here is a 28 days. Okay? It's the average human female menstrual cycle. And so the ovary grows. Inside the ovary is an egg growing. And at the middle of the cycle, day 14, ovulation, the production of the egg. That is driven by a rise in these two hormones up here called LH and FSH from the pituitary gland. Notice that these hormones spike right before ovulation. Okay, or right at ovulation. It's a surge in that it triggers ovulation. Also, ovarian hormones, hormones from the ovary, one called estrogen, rises right before uh, the egg is produced. And then after the production of the egg, one called progesterone rises. Okay, and notice the rise in those corresponds with the rise in the wall, in the endometrium of the uterus. Why does this happen? To get ready for a baby. If the egg is not fertilized, no fertilization, these hormone levels all drop off. And soon after that, the wall of the uterus is shed out the vagina. That's called menstruation. Okay? If the egg is not fertilized. If the egg is fertilized, this level is going to keep going up. The wall of the uterus will not be shed. That's why when... Uh, females, quote, miss their period that they may be pregnant. Okay, this uh, is just uh, what happens to produce, to produce testosterone, which leads to spermatogenesis. Okay, and again, it's, it's uh, from the brain, uh, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus in the male. So, there's a lot of great gory details in the textbook about this. We're kind of skipping from fertilization to pregnancy. You don't really need to know all the uh, details of fertilization. But you should know that in humans and other mammals, an embryo goes into the newborn into the uterus. Okay, and we're going to look at that in this chapter in a little bit, chapter 47. Pregnancy or gestation is a condition of carrying one or more embryos in the uterus. The duration of pregnancy varies with body size and maturity of the young. So a human's uh, gestation period is 267 days on the average. Okay, or something like an elephant is two years. It's called a gestation period. So uh, conception fertilization of an egg by sperm occurs in the oviduct or fallopian tube. It has to. Sperm has to meet the egg there. And so then it says, after fertilization, the zygote undergoes cleavage, which means you start as one cell and become two, and then four, and then eight. And it develops into something called a blastocyst. And then we're going to talk, look at that in a little bit of detail in the next chapter. But then it implants itself into the endometrium. These next couple slides show this idea. The egg is released from the ovary. It has to meet sperm in this tube. It's in that tube for anywhere from three to five days. As it goes, the egg starts to divide. You can see that being shown here. And it comes and sticks itself in the wall of the uterus about five days after fertilization. Here's a closer view of what's called a blastocyst. It's a ball of cells and it buries itself into the endometrium. 
this thing growing here is going to be called the placenta, and it's going to feed the baby. So we divide human gestation into three trimesters of three months. Okay? It's the first trimester where you get the most change. So after the first couple weeks, here's an infant or a fetus. Around the fetus is what's called the amniotic sac. You see the umbilical cord. And this is what's called the placenta. Maternal arteries and veins come into the placenta. Baby's arteries and veins come into the placenta. But notice, mom's blood just kind of filters around in here. They don't, sh they don't share blood vessels. So mom feeds the baby through her arteries and takes baby's wastes away through her veins. So in the first trimester is when you get the development of organs. Okay, here's a, just a quick view of five weeks, 14 weeks, and 20 weeks. Second trimester, you're getting growing. Uh, the uterus, the pregnancy is now obvious. Mom can feel the baby moving around. Third trimester is when the fetus grows and fills up the space. And then we get labor and childbirth. Okay, and in pretty much all mammals. All right, this is a positive feedback loop where as the baby's head starts pushing on the outside part of the uterus called the cervix. There are nerves in here that send messages up to the brain to produce a hormone called oxytocin. Notice it says mother's posterior pituitary, which is the pituitary gland. Oxytocin stimulates the placenta to contract, stimulates the placenta to make prostaglandins, which are a kind of hormone-like substance. Both of these things stimulate the uterus. As the uterus contracts, baby's head pushes far, so the whole uterus squeezes on the baby, pushes the head farther down, this widens. That stimulates more oxytocin, which means more contraction, which means more pushing, which means more prostaglandins, which means more oxytocin, and you get this continuous rapid fire feedback loop as the contractions get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until the baby is expelled. Okay, and so the, the cervix widens, you measure that, they call that dilation, and the baby is delivered out to the vagina. And that's the end of this discussion of reproduction.